Um, so this session is about uh, GDPR. We have decided to present it as a duo. Um, so I'm Cathy Lee from Neva Web in France, and this is Benoît Sarton from uh, BSE Informatique in France as well. Just a reminder of the sponsors that have enabled this to happen. Thank you to them. Um, so during this session, um, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that within the company at Neva Web, I'm uh, in charge of um, projects and clients, so I do not do any technical work. And um, Benoit is the same, but he's a bit more technical than me. So I'm going to be um, doing the, the introduction um, regarding juridical and technical context for the GDPR and its main application. Uh, then we're going to give you ways and examples um, that, have, that we have used uh, to address uh, the GDPR within our own businesses. And then we would like to open a discussion because it's already started since we've uh, gathered on Thursday. So we thought we'll uh, allow for the last 20 minutes where we can share uh, good practices, uh, questions you may have and we might be able to answer. Refer back to uh, the original, the original uh, text because we have found that some people sometimes have uh, forgotten about it and it's quite clear and, and simple in certain areas. So, uh, the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation and it has come into application on May the 25th, which was uh, a week ago. But it was actually adopted by the European Union um, as a regulation in April 2006. Sorry, 2016. Yeah. Sorry. It is a regulation it is not a directive given by the European Union. It means, uh, a regulation means that it tells us the way the required objectives must be met, um, as opposed to a directive which let us, do, um, let us do it the way we want to, okay? As long as the objectives are met. So this is a regulation and there are ways to become compliant that have been uh, announced and described and we just uh, need to follow them, really. Um, the GDPR is exclusively about personal data. So I'll give you some examples of personal data. It's a name, a localization data, a login, an identification number, an IP address. A personal data is a data that enables you to identify a physical person. It's as simple as that. So the question about the moral person, the businesses, uh, has come up and uh, the answer is that the GDPR doesn't apply in this case unless uh, this moral person is represented by a physical person, which means any businesses is finally concerned in the end. But uh, a company number, for example, will not be concerned by the regulation. The GDPR is about how uh, personal data is treated and by treated we mean collecting, keeping, recording, modifying, using, archiving, deleting, communicating it, etc. There are many ways personal data is treated. So the GDPR concerns all companies or private and public organisation of the 28 member states of the European Union, but it will also apply uh, to a company that is outside the EU uh, as soon as it collects personal data of EU residents. The sanctions can be uh, quite dramatic for a large company with a large turnover because it's 2 to 4 percent, yes Peter? If there are no residents, 
EU residents, not citizens. Uh, so it's between 2 uh, and 4% of their global yearly turnover, or up to 20 million euro for the sanctions. Um, now, this has just come into applications and uh, for a lot of countries, uh, the, the systems of checking uh, compliancy are not in place yet and inspectors are not, have not started to walk around the country uh, knocking on doors to check this. Um, and the, the fact is that as long as you have initiated the process of becoming compliant by the 25th of May last week, uh, then you won't um, run the risk of being uh, fined. As long as you've made an effort <laughs> to do something about it. So just attending this session ticks that box. <laughs> the advantages for us, um, well, first of all, we can provide new services and products to sell to our clients. So that's financial advantage. Uh, it, it will become, and it's already started for us anyway, uh, a competition advantage uh, for companies when we are um, replying to a call for tenders, for example. Okay, so these large companies um, making a choice and selecting their uh, service providers are going to start asking, are you GDPR compliant? And it could be something that uh, pushes you out of the... the the final candidates when replying to uh, um, call for tenders. Do you mean are you or will our website be? If the website is a reflection of what you do, of course the, the, the website will be looked at, but no, you, you as a service provider will be asked the question, are you, have, you, have you done what's needed to be done? So the four key principles of uh, the GDPR are consent, transparency, people's rights and responsibility. In terms of consent, I've, uh, I've read a sentence somewhere last week and I thought, yeah, that's clear enough in my head. No yes means no. Okay? Because consent must be an explicit, active and affirmative action by the data subject. So it's not the passive acceptance that we've had up till now with like pre-tick boxes, for example, or uh, opt-outs. It's really an active action from the data subject saying, yes, you can. Uh, as for controllers like us, uh, we need to keep a record of how and when an individual has agreed uh, and gave their consent for you to use their personal data. And you need to let these um, data subjects know how they can withdraw their consent. That needs to be clear, because they have the right also to withdraw their consent. Transparency is about the what, the why, the how. So what we need to have with the GDPR, we need to have the information available to our data subjects of uh, so our data subjects are our clients, our prospects, our partners, our providers. Okay, as soon as you uh, deal with a, a physical person and uh, personal data is involved, they become uh, concerned by your, your rules and your policies. And we need to tell them um, how we treat their personal data. So um, what kind of personal data we keep of them, where do we keep it, how, how secure we uh, make this uh, way of keeping it, how long we keep it for and, and what for exactly, how we destroy them when they ask us to destroy their personal data. All this process of personal data treatment needs to be uh, clear in our heads and in theirs when they ask. Ideally, uh, you've already written a personal uh, data protection policy or you had one before that you've maybe completed last week before you came, um, where you describe all this in a very clear manner. Um, it doesn't need to be displayed on, on your website as long as you've got one. It doesn't need to be displayed there, but it needs to be accessible in an easy manner. This is what a lot of people have opted for 
the idea of putting it on a website. Uh, people's rights is about accessing their personal data and with the GDPR it needs to be facilitated by us for them. Uh, they need to know, for example, which process that they can use in order to request the deletion of their data. Uh, and that deletion of data must be facilitated today. Uh, a collector like us of personal data uh, will pass on personal data of our, of our subjects and clients to other uh, companies we work with. Um, these companies are responsible for their personal data treatment and when we choose them, of course, we, we check that now, maybe, a little bit more than we used to. But if they don't do something right, we are 50% responsible in the end. So I think we need to be a bit more careful in our choices of providers and subcontractors. Can you repeat Yes, if they are caught not being compliant with GDPR and uh, not um, dealing with personal data in the correct manner, we will be held 50% responsible in the end because we made that link between the data subject and them. So we need to be very careful there. Our subcontractors will issue uh, certificates. I mean, I've collected quite a few by now. I've been a bit of a pain with them. And I've expected them to send me something saying, yes, we've done this, this and that. And I've, I've been collecting that for a while now. Uh, responsibility, so the deal has changed with this new regulation and what the European Union is trying to do today is empower the companies, is, melt, is make them and encourage them to self-check what they do really and to um, document everything that they do in writing in, if possible. Uh, this is what Benoit will go on to in a minute. Um, so that all processes of treatment of personal data is documented and detailed. Of course, this uh, process of writing your processes is a good exercise we've been starting in our own company and it enables you to realise that there is data you keep uh, and there's no need for you to keep it. Uh, you also realise that uh, some processes are not secure enough um, there's a lot of things that will make improve ways we work, really. So that's an advantage, I think. Uh, in France, we have a, a commission called Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et des Libertés. It's la CNIL. And this commission, there's one in every country, and these commissions are helping with this. Uh, and this is why maybe there is a certain debate within the group here, because each country has been given maybe different advice or different ways of approaching it. Authorities, Authorities yes. Uh, LACNIL in France, and this is what I've put up here, has given us six uh, simple steps to quickly become uh, GDPR compliant, or at least to initiate this uh, process of becoming compliant. Um, the first one is about designating a GDPR pilot or a DPO for large companies. A DPO is a data protection officer. Uh, this is the person who orchestrates the implementation of the GDPR in the company. And this person cannot be the same person who is responsible for it, the boss. So I, if I'm responsible for the GDPR in my company, I cannot be the one orchestrating it so and organizing it. Well, yeah, in our case it works because there's four of us. In so in some other companies, uh, and when somebody works on their own, I think they won't have a choice really, really, apart from subcontracting that work, which they won't want to do. It can be, but that costs money. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, a DPO is compulsory. The data protection officer is compulsory for uh, public organisations or for companies who keep large numbers of personal data or for companies who deal with uh, sensible data. In those cases, a DPO is compulsory. Uh, town halls and um, councils have to employ a DPO externally. And Benoit will come back onto this in a minute. 
Um, so the, the pilot, the, the GDPR pilot, if you ask him to orchestrate the process of becoming compliant, you need to enable them to have access to everything to, they need to have access to. So if this is one of your employee, suddenly this employee needs to have access to everything. Of course, otherwise they won't be able to do their job properly. Um, mapping the personal data treatment uh, can be a difficult exercise, I think, and we've been advised to uh, segment the different activities of the company in very small segments in order to be able to decide for each of these processes of treatment of personal data, what do we do exactly? And this is about the mapping of the treatment. So the questions you need to be able to answer is, what personal data do I collect there? And whose is it? Is it my clients? Is it my providers? Is it my subcontractors? Uh, who uses that data in the end? What for? What's the purpose of that use? Where is it kept? In which manner? How long do we keep it? How secure? And I've already uh, described this. How do we archive it? And how do we destroy it when we ask to destroy it? Um, it enables you to adjust a few things I was saying earlier. Um, and obviously, I think a, a lot of us needs to review possibly our security, uh, the, the secure manner in which we, we keep these data, which have been sometimes you know, left lying around and on the desks. For example, I'm thinking about when we uh, were looking for a, a new uh, employee and the CVs were just lying around on my desk. And when I was going home at night, it was just there. Well, this is not good anymore. And once the um, interviews had finished, these CVs should be binned because there isn't an actual need to keep them unless you have another uh, project of employment coming up soon. Hey. Yes, yes. Uh, organizing actions and managing risks. Just keeping an eye on time. Okay, I need to finish off. Um, these questions are quite interesting, and we've had a, a couple of meetings within our companies where we've uh, highlighted processes that we need to adjust. Um, and these actions have enabled us to, to really improve, actually, the way we work and to work faster. The processing register is uh, the, the actual register in which you're going to gather all these, um, all these processes that you carry out within your company. Um, and you need to, to be able to have an entry, and this is what Benoit will detail in a minute, about each of these processes and what they are for, what they are about, how are they dealt with, etc. So it can be... A, an actual paper file, or it could be done a different way. Um, in our company, and then I'll pass on the microphone to Benoit, um, there's four of us, as I said. We have about 200 active clients at the moment. We've got various areas within the company where we keep their personal data. Uh, what we've done by last Friday was tidy up a little bit, uh, looked into it, decided which data was redundant really and that there was no need to keep it. We've done that and we've also informed our clients about this because of course some of you might have noticed that we are the first uh, idea of contact from our client's point of view. So we've had quite a lot of phone calls and I'm sure you've had the same uh, situation. So we've been providing um, advice, uh, training even, and of course services and products that we can provide to them in order to help them become compliant through their websites anyway. As for the internal uh, processes outside of their websites, we've not, Neva Web has decided not to provide any extra services in this area yet. À toi. Come on. Ouais. Ok, so, il faut que tu mettes ça. Pour um. l'enregistrement. Ah, d'accord. Ça se 
non, non, ça c'est pour mettre. Ouais, ça tu veux dans ma poche. Ok, my part is practical stuff and, and advice. So the, my first practical stuff is just to read the official text, which almost nobody I've talked to has done, including lawyers who were doing presentation like this, and I'm convinced that they did not read the official European text. Why I suggest to read it, it's very easy. It's um, made of uh, 99 uh, um, parts, uh, which are articles, 99 articles. Uh, you can read it within an hour. An article is about 10 lines, and all points that Cathy mentioned are explained in plain French, English, or any other of the 24 <coughs> European languages. Um, I would say there are two kinds of articles. Um, they are all legal articles, most of them, but one is for us, for geeks. It's article 32. So if you don't take time to read uh, all articles, uh, I would suggest to you to read the first one, the first chapter, let's say the 41st articles are very interesting. They explain what GDPR is. It's easy to read. It's a 20 minutes read. If you have time to read only one article, you can read article 32. Yeah. I'm not, I was not on TV. <laughs> So article 32 is the article for geeks. Well, it's fun because 32 is, um, is a binary number. It's 2 power 5. So <laughs> there must be some kind of humor um, at, uh, in Brussels with the, the, these lawyers. Um, so um, article 32 explains what has to be done in terms of security. And the lawyers don't know about that. And that's where we can enter the game. Because I've never seen a lawyer understanding what is encryption, or what is a backup, or what is a restore. I'll get back on this later and explain how I extended my business by offering services to my customers um, with this kind of stuff. OK, second um, practical stuff I would like to show you. I don't know if you've seen that. There's a Microsoft document. Tu, tu peux me le sortir, le PDF de Microsoft, là Allez, ça va être. Tu l'as déjà ouvert Non. Alors, Alors euh, il est soit là. Il yeah. est là. Je vais te le mettre là. Je vais te la souris. So, this is a Microsoft document. You can easily download it or I, I can give it to you. Um, they explain uh, what you can do with SQL Server to uh, enforce um, GDPR compliancy. So you have easy trick that you can do, do to prove your customers that you've done something with SQL Server to protect data. So I will show only one, which is um, the masked columns. I don't know if you have heard of that. Um, yeah, can, can you search for mask? Oh, okay. Masked columns means that you can, you can tell SQL Server that such columns, for example, names, can be displayed only with a pattern that you define, for example, the first and the last letter. So I'll show you how it works. At the bottom. Oh, can you see it? Okay, sorry. Yeah, Thank you. Bye, Danny. Tu peux aller sur ce site admin.fievre.fr et puis j'ai un login et un mot de passe. Okay. I'll show you on the website with um, uh, with medical data how I use this. 
Um, so the principle is that uh, you see on the top, on the yellow uh, square there, you can hide a phone number or um, uh, national security number, identification uh, number, you can mask it. And it's security at the heart of SQL Server. So that's a very easy way to, uh, um, to hide data and to uh, prove that you've done something to enforce security. Um, the problem we have is uh, with DNN uh, is that um, as far as I know, I'm looking at you architect guys, um, you can only log in with one um, connection string. So you can lose on, use only one um, SQL Server login. And to, uh, um, to leverage this capability of SQL Server, you have to use a different SQL Server login. So what I would suggest, if that's possible someday, is that when you log in with DNN, uh, there could be two connection strings, one for unauthenticated users and the other for authenticated user. That would be the first connection string would be used for general purpose and unauthenticated users. And if the user is authenticated in DNN that database, then they will change the SQL login to get another login, which would permit to show those columns. Because obviously, admins need to see a name, or a first name, or a date of birth. But I can see no case where an uh, unauthenticated user, anonymous users, have no reason to see this data. Okay, so this is a small example how uh, we, can, we could use something to say, hey, DNN is GDPR compliant, or DNN offers very strong and powerful tools to help you be GDPR compliant. I'll show you an example of a uh, website here. Yeah, this one here. Il est, il est là. Tu l'as là. Okay. So here you can see um, a file with masked data. So the name is masked, the first name is masked, the date of birth is not. Um, this is a limitation of that mask system in SQL Server. It's, it, it, it's not easy to say. You cannot apply on uh, date time um, type. You cannot say I want to see only the year. That's what I would like because it would be useful to see the year, but I don't need the full date of birth. This is a file that's for medical statistics. So if I read it um, with the GDPR in mind, I don't need the day of birth for statistics. The year, the age of the patient is enough. So um, if I want to be GDPR compliant, I should say the full date of year is too much too much information, I don't need it for the purpose of my processing. Another uh, weak point, uh, something else I've done before, when they enter this, they could see the list of all patients. So I've limited this to the last 10, and that's only a small thing, but at, that's a void. Uh, um, the, the admins that use it to see the full list, they don't need it. They <coughs> Usually, they need to see only the last one. Of course, they, you can search a name and edit the, 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 the patient you want. Something that's not GDPR compliant here, that's not very good that I should improve, is that I use IDs. Yeah, can you, um, if I select a, a patient here, So on the top URL, you can see the, the number, the ID of that, of that person. That's not good. You should use GUIDs to avoid, because someone could, um, in the URL, um, test 2084, 2085, and see all patients. Um, so that's not very good. And I should add an extra layer of protection. 
So you understand by with this small example of my point, there are very easy things we can do and explain that we are or we are becoming more GDPR compliant. Never forget that GDPR is a common sense. Um, I've seen you raising your eyebrow um, uh, when, when he said that you have to encrypt, it, encrypt your laptop or so. Uh, you don't have to encrypt your laptop. You have to think about it, ask you the question, and answer and depending on the context. And you have to decide if um, the measures that you will take are in proportion uh, um, to uh, the risks that are exposed. That's, that's the basic idea in the GDPR. It depends on the data you're dealing with. If you're a doctor or if you're a lawyer, of course you have a lot of sensitive data on your laptop. And, and Obviously. And what, what Obviously. Obviously more important there. than you're just storing a few uh, emails uh, which uh, don't usually con uh, contain sensitive personal data, for example, for us with, with the client where we have maybe an invoice forward uh, service or whatever. So it's, it's, it's not as uh, you have to be really uh, think about is there a risk, uh, how high is the risk and the, uh, the, the uh, GDPR also classifies uh, data which is very sensitive like medical, like yes. uh, sexual preferences and so on, uh, which needs to be protected higher than just the address or the name. Well, yeah, health data are special case of sensible data. There's, there are, um, a ch there's a chapter on this in GDPR and with religion and, and, and this kind of thing. So it's special. But anyway, the, the, the general principle is there. Uh, you, for example, there's nothing in GDPR about how many uh, records you have in your database. Uh, obviously, it's common sense that if you have millions of people, it's not the same than if you have Ten people, okay? But obviously, lawyers c cannot make a difference because the the importance of data is as important for one person than for one thousand. But obviously, on the other side, um, it's easy to understand that you don't have to take the same measures um, if you have a very limited number of people or if you have many people. Okay, now my, my, four, my third uh, practical point is an Excel sheet that I received from a UK company last week and that, that I, have, I had to fill um, to be recorded as a supplier. And that's um, when people tell me, well, I don't have to do a GDPR, it's not necessary, I will tell them why it's necessary. Because sooner or later, someone will ask you, are you... GDPR compliant and please prove it, otherwise you cannot be my supplier. Because as a supplier you are a processor and uh, so uh, you involved us in the GDPR risks. Is there um, any, I mean the weakest area which I haven't heard from anyone is, let's say I've got a team of 10 that have access to the database. Each of those person is the weakest thing. If that person leaves, can take all the data with them. Yes. Do they require every developer now have NDAs? They they NDAs. require they require you to Please think. The the okay. The question is: You have ten people working with you, yeah. and uh, all and someday some will leave the company, and and what do you have to do so regarding the risk? Theoretically speaking, that person that leaves is the, is the person that can take all the data. Yes. Well, the you, you've already thought about that by, by the time they leave, hopefully. So, um, is this, does GDRP have regulations? Added? Yes. No, they, 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 they have no precise answers to this kind of question, but they say you must have thought about it. <coughs> you must have a procedure that decides what you do when people leave, how long this data will live, when will you destroy it. Yes. It's your job. Yeah. That's, that's the job. 
It's but your then, job to talk to your employees. But isn't it all also well, that you didn't know that he takes something with you? Yeah, because you sure. there's no, no, no obligation that you have to control your, your, your employees. That's up to you, uh, that's up to you, Sebastian. But you have, of course, you have to make your uh, employees to sign that they are exactly. of data protection. And, and the regulation, and they, if they violate, they might be pro you, uh, prosecuted. You do it the way you, the way you do it the way you want. The, the fact is that you will be responsible if something goes wrong. It's as simple as that. But isn't it also that you should have as little admins as possible? You should think about it. Not you should just give everybody admins. I was going to say you should think about the way of limiting maybe this access. Is it, if it's not necessary, don't give it. But I would have thought now one needs. Special NDA GDPR NDA between any administrator and the company that has it. It's a good idea. Why not? You know, special Yes, why not? That, that, and, you yes. Have, and you should have make notes of who has access. Yes. You shouldn't forget that. I think it's a simple way of protecting yourself anyway and, and do it what you can now to uh, minimize the risks. And that's the idea. Maybe. <coughs> Benoit, you mentioned uh, your suppliers. Uh, have, have, I'm just curious, have your suppliers provided data processor addendums? Yes. They, have, they do provide those. I didn't know if, it, if, if they've been reaching out to provide those across the board and stuff. Uh, excuse me, I, I, I didn't understand the, the uh, question. The ar article 28 for data processors, there's the data processor addendum that's a, a essentially a contractual requirement Yes. And we had to do the same thing with our sub processors as well. Yes. So I was just curious if your supplier had actually provided uh, a data processor in them. Um. Uh, by the way, this is 38. a tool. 38. Uh, 38. So it's 38. 38. 28. Yeah. 28. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I, I understood the question. I will talk about processors, but whether you have been actively approached by you, the, the people that are processing your data with, look, we have uh, an agreement for you, yes. or whether you are, that's one of your question, right? Yeah. Yes, you need to contract anyway. No, I mean, you're, like you're renting a server somewhere, yes. and did they yes. actively approach you to, yes. with, with, uh, with the data processing agreement? Yes, that, that, that's what I, I wanted to show on this Excel. Okay, in that, in that Excel sheet, so it's, it's a UK company and uh, we're going to uh, host their website, a DNN website, but there's absolutely no personal data in this website. So I would assume that they don't have to ask me for any special kind of compliance. Wrong, wrong. I'm a supplier. So I must be GDPR compliant, no matter if I'm a supplier for a specific processing uh, um, of, of, of personal data or not. So because all suppliers will have to say, hey, I'm GDPR compliant. And I mean, I only if they have to deal with, uh, or as a chance, as they deal with personal data, no. and of course, as a no. and yeah. on the website, okay. My no, okay, my, 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 okay. I, I make it more clear. You're right, Sebastian. But my point is that from GDPR um, standpoint, obviously, in that case, they didn't have to ask me to fill this form. But I suppose that most large companies will do it anyway, no matter if they have to do it or not, because it's easier, it's a process, and any supplier will have to be GDPR compliant. And in this case, you will see, it's a very long form, it took me two hours to fill it, and I had to, to say that I control my switch and router's logs every day, every day, okay? So I said yes, so I went see my tech guys, and I said, do you check the router logs every day? <laughs> <laughs> no? 
So I said yes, to, so please do it <laughs> today. <laughs> um, so, it, okay, and there are many other things. I had to sign, it, this is not GDPR, but I had to tell that nobody can see my screen from the outside window and, and things like this. Okay, so well, we're going to. Mm -hmm. Because we got some it people with some stuff in it that we thought, okay, this is, and we just said, no, we're not going to sign this. Yeah, but that's the risk of not getting the market. Yeah, well then, I, think I mean, I'm not going to sign stuff I'm not going to do. Ah, okay, you're like that, yes, yeah, but I when mean, does... This, you know, we, we have <laughs> <laughs> I think there are going to be extremes. And well, be I think we have well, to be pragmatic. Yeah, These guys. We had it with a, with, a, with a company of lawyers, and I know that if I sign it, and one day they somehow find out. So we, we okay. said we're not going to. Yeah. So okay. okay. I think it's, it's a, a decision. Choice, yeah. and I think also in our clients, we've had people asking us things that are not necessary. Okay. Uh, um, my. At and, not, and, not, and not required. Yeah. And we've just done it. I mean, I think uh, everybody uh, has been interpreting things uh, in their own way. And this is a good uh, tool on the legal text. If you type legal text to GDPR, you can put your native language and the original text. And I think that's interesting because translations, we noted uh, a couple of translations that are a bit iffy. <laughs> iffy. It's, it's about subcontractors and it's been translated into something completely different. Mm -hmm. So take care. Yeah, be, because, okay, you, um, one, one, one. Already by the EU, so, so you have to take the original, uh, which is uh, in the language you understand. Okay, yeah, exactly. You're right, and you can have this side-by-side -side, um, translation, which is very useful if you're not in an English-speaking country. Because sometimes uh, the terms are not, not exactly the translation you would expect. As the processor, processor was translated into French as subcontractor, but in fact the term processor is more general. The processor can be inside, as I understand the text, can be inside the company. If the boss asks for a special processing, uh, it's, 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 the, the processor can be a person. No, 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 no. It's a subcontractor. It's you not you clear. Have a, an, a legal entity under the EU that is a, a subcontractor as a person, or the, uh, because it's about contracts, uh, you can make it, you, uh, it. It doesn't deal with employees, with, with uh, uh, company and employees. That's not the subject of this language. But it shows how difficult it is to read. Yeah, and I think we're not pointing out the Article 28. Yeah, yeah but, but the, 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 um, there are, uh, it's really been released in multiple languages and yeah. to be often, yeah, th th it's not released but just in English and then translated, but it's released in multiple languages. Exactly, and the countries, I think, have dealt with these official translations. Mm -hmm. What we found, though, is that when we read the original text, which is issued by the EU, mm -hmm. it's been translated into our language, which we know and master, differently. Okay. We've spotted a couple of incoherence. Which, That's all. Do you know what was, what was the original language? English. It English. Sorry? It was discussed in English, but it was released in multiple languages. There's a EU regulation, so it's, it, it's all still the dribble and the French one. The, I think with the five uh, major languages, it has to be translated. Yeah. And then the other, they get, uh, it has to be released, and the others are translation. Yeah. So it's, it's a, that's that's right. Right. Is there any certification cloud for voting? No. Like, uh, 27,001. Yeah, there's not announced it, but I'm pretty convinced that it will come out soon. I've already been asked for a certificate. Yeah, 27,001. But the EU doesn't currently have any no, certification not. institution, but of course they, they think about the process, but, but it's, you have to know that, that lots of the, the details are still in, exactly. in the works. We, we're looking for the uh, e uh, privacy directive, and we're waiting, yeah. which is, should have been released the same day. Yeah. Uh, or meanwhile, but they are delayed, and they, it will not be released before next year. Exactly. So, so we have a lot of problems in, in that. True. But it, I think it will be a specific GDPR certification certificate. Just like you can uh, print out of your software, I've already printed a few, a, a certified uh, paper, you know, a paper saying that this software is GDPR compliant. 
have printed it from my uh, accountancy page, for example. I'm, I'm not sure, because everybody needs to be compliant. So why make a certification for everybody? If you, so it's, I'm not sure. We'll well, as, as Sebastian is saying, I it will be the idea be is that you have an audit with, a, uh, yeah. with, with some uh, certified uh, auditors, and they simply say, we audited you, so um, we, we checked what you did, and, and it looks good. So uh, if uh, an uh, authority is coming to you, and uh, the data protection authority, that are you compliant? You can say, hey, we, we already checked it, and then uh, they won't try to do it all the okay. again. Uh, okay. Like uh, that's a the, the point is, I think, more or less, um, the software is a piece of software, and uh, the point, if, if it's GDPR compliant, is more or less what we do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. the software, yeah. yeah. it's yes. software, it's what we do with the it. The other thing is, you can uh, get an audit today and you say, okay, today, everything you do, you behave, everything we, we check is GDPR compliant. It's okay, but tomorrow, uh, they find a big part on the internet processors and, yes. uh, and you are not anymore. You're, so, uh, you're right. That's, that's when well, you change your business, get, yeah. get a new set of yeah. Yeah, personal data yeah. for some reason, get a client. Okay. My, 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 um, uh, uh, authority in every country that's in charge to decide if there are penalties or not and it will depend on the country. For example for the GAFAM it will be in Ireland except the, La the Irish authority except for f uh, I think uh, Amazon in, in Luc Luxembourg I think uh, but in France for example it's the CNIL uh, that will decide if there are penalties or not. And my, my final practical point is that I think that we can play a role um, um, doing consultancy for our customer because this Article 32, which says that you must protect data, encrypt it, backup it, restore it, save it, say how long data will be kept, etc., 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 is not a thing for lawyers, it's a thing for us. And that's why I'm starting to offer my services. Um, I can play the role of DPO for my customer who um, want it. Um, I offer a basic entry price of um, 500 euros just to open the register. The register is the record of processing. I've done a tool online so my customer can register with me online uh, the main processing uh, and then I have a monthly fee of um, 50 euros per month just to uh, help them uh, keep this compliancy in time and uh, they are well the first customers I've done uh, I've done are happy with that because they didn't know what to do. And if you ask your customer, okay, are you GDPR compliant? Most small companies say, well, what's that? I don't know. I've heard a lawyer, but I understand nothing. I don't know what I have to do. I don't know wh what should I start to do uh, when I get back to my office. And here I, I explain that I can help them. It's mostly um, IT security. This is something we've done for many years. Okay, five minutes. And, and I, I think that we can help them with that. And we don't want to be a kind of um, um, controller, but we would like to be their Mr. Security and help them uh, um, to, um, to, to enforce things that they should have done anyway. And they probably they should have done before. So that includes helping them redacting their um, um, terms, legal terms on websites, and deciding how long they keep their archives, etc. Data protection policies. That's of course a question: How does it affect CNN, and how does it? Uh, what do we need to do with our websites? 
and what needs to be done in DNN. And this will be the subject of the talk, the next talk here mm -hmm. uh, by Mitch Salas and me, where we will discuss what we're going to do with the DNN platform, what you can do now already to, uh, to be compliant. Is it and, next? Uh, we after this session? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the Q&A. Uh, after after lunch. Lunch. No, it's not the Q&A. Oh, it's a proper no. session, but it's more technical based. Yes. So this is Sebastian and Mitch. And um, we're still looking for people who would like to join and, and help. Yeah. You showed uh, a part of the Microsoft document about masking your database. Yes. Uh, but in Article 32, they say you have to um, encrypt it. Yes. Um, but if you can use another connection string, it's not actual encryption. So I, I assume that's not enough. No, it depends on the case. The thing, there are things that must be encrypted, such as passwords. Yeah. But something like, uh, um, or, or you can encrypt the whole database. Mm -hmm. Or encrypt, encryption is not one measure among others. And it's up to you to decide if you need to apply it or it not. Should it should be technically useful. That's true. And you, should, you, should, you should consider how you protect the data, yeah. whether you do encryption, yeah, there's, there's, there's and whether you do other technical, that you put your uh, server in the locker or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so you, this, these, uh, uh, you have to think about it. They, they don't say you have to, but they say yeah. you have to consider what makes sense. Uh, and there's a difference between personal data and sensitive personal data, yeah. like your your your, yes. your, your, your religion or religion and stuff like yeah. that. So okay, sensible data are defined in GDPR. Mm -hmm. They are political uh, opinions, uh, sexual preferences, um, health, medical, uh, medical, and uh, finance. I think. Yeah. And. And children, obviously. Okay. It's another problem that uh, you can only get uh, the, the uh, grant, for example, from a membership for, from, from a person from over 16. That means if you, you have a website for children, you have to have the grant by the parents, which makes it a little bit more difficult. That's but very it, difficult. No, but one, one, once again, don't. That, that okay. This, uh, Please, I, I would like to finish. My last words would be that. Don't forget that GDPR is common sense and balance and proportion between um, the processing and the measures that you will take. So let's not um, consider that all cases have the same solutions. It depends on every case. It's very practical. If you, I don't know, if you sell uh, clothes, it's not the same that if you sell porn. Uh, regarding the, the, co the consent of children. Uh, that's obvious. And so any case has to be, uh, deserves a, a, a specific uh, treatment, I believe. And that's the reason why you can't have, why we can't have a template of all the, uh, of a general GDPR um, a no. privacy yeah. statement for DNN, no. which applies to all websites. And that's why our customers need us. That's why they need that's us. That's why our customers need us to help them uh, sort out what they have to do. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.